O come, thou day spring from on high, and cheer us by thy drawing nigh. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadow put to flight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I saw a cartoon today that almost has nothing to do with the sermon, but it is a Christmas theme and it was too delicious not to share it. I hope that's okay. Mary and Joseph arrive into town. Two women saddle up to them and say, oh, Mary and Joseph. And one says, well, you know, my Nathan just graduated from law school. And another woman leaned into Mary and she said, and my Jonathan is now going to be a doctor. And Mary said later, it was all I could do to keep from saying, well, my Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> I love it because there's a kind of gutsy truth to this. You see, <laughs> I actually believe this stuff. I, I believe with all of my heart the story of Bethlehem, the Mary, Mary Major, the shepherd, the stars, this unassuming couple from Nazareth, angels, the baby, Lord at his birth. Uh, as one person said, I'll never get over the way that God did it. And the reason that for me is so important, so profoundly important, that in the midst of a day where the order of the day feels like gloom. It's not getting any better out there, is it? That somehow, in the midst of all of this gloom and darkness, and quite frankly, the demonic temptation to live under that darkness because it is so real and speaking to us on every side, whether we're talking about politics, whether we are talking about the economy, whether we are talking about the state of the world order, whether it's even talking about the difficulty of friends that we know, or maybe even us who are wrestling with incurable illnesses, or the family breakdown, the tragedy of deaths that have happened over this year that caused Christmas to be less than shiny, if at least what we are hoping for is you know, everybody gathered around at the table again. There is no pain like the pain of the empty chair at the dining room table at Christmas, right? But you see, if, if that's all there was, if the epitome of Christmas was the true love of a Hallmark movie, few of us could rejoice at Christmas unless we fit the profile. More often than not, white, right? Upper middle class, lots of extended family, and the little turn of romance that just causes everything to light up. Joy to the world. To me, it just feels so superficial when what is being offered to us by God himself is so much richer so much more powerful, so much more realistic. Because the promise is not merely for the winsome sentimentality of what Christmas might have been. It's even more powerful than the grief of that which we have lost. No. Isaiah's words... You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. Or let me put it in a very personal way. God, because of what we have been given in Jesus, has increased our joy. We rejoice before God as at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. And that's not some sort of nice kind of Merry Christmas. That's the kicking of heels, the, the, chine, the chinging of glasses, the big, broad laughter of the relief of abundance that only God can provide. Because the yoke of my burden, 
The bar across my shoulders, the rod of my oppressor has been broken as at the day of Midian. Meaning, God did it, and there's a new freedom that wasn't there before. And that it is not something that is merely a, a kind of inner personal experience, although it certainly is that. But it is something that is literally going across the planet for all the boots of the trampling warriors, all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. And what should cause that? This. For to us a child has been born. Now, <laughs> it takes something to be able to make that connection between literally an avalanche of power that eventually causes all war to cease, all economic oppression to be done away with, tyranny abolished, and the birth of a small baby on the backside of Bethlehem. And yet, it is literally between that promise and this event that we stand, juxtaposed, as it were, between the glory of the promise and the gross temptation that all of us feel to believe that what happened in Bethlehem when it comes to my real life is patently irrelevant. But the promise of Scripture, as Paul says so clearly in Titus, is that the grace of God has appeared. And this is what he's referring to, literally the whole life of Jesus. The word appeared in that language could actually imply the coming of a hero, someone who comes and brings rescue, someone who comes and breaks oppression and brings us into a place of freedom that we could never, ever have experienced without the coming of such a hero. And that is, in fact, precisely what is offered to us in Jesus Christ. Because, you see, it is in Jesus that our lives are set right. He has put something supernaturally new in us that is, in fact, more strong and more powerful than the great oppression of darkness that wants to envelop us in its midst so that all we have left of Christmas is the cheer and the alcohol glass and the wish that somehow things might be better. Well, I don't know about you, but I cannot afford to yield to that kind of sentimentality because I know how superficial it actually is. You, you see, in the midst of clergy sexual misconduct, corruption on every side, in the midst of the failure of so many of our institutions to commend themselves as places of integrity and honor, unless that baby born in a manger is the Son of God, I'm sunk. There is no plan B. There is no place to which I can turn that somehow will put a level of purpose in my life that allows me to live with any sort of dignity. Because you see, if that's not true, all I have left is the dog-eat-dog, -dog, do whatever it takes to get by, the ends justifies the means that is so prevalent that all of us bemoan. But that is because God, God has put something in our heart that longs for for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders and no one else's. You see, beloved, if that is true, in the midst of all that we know and all that we live in, we can lean into him in a way that allows us to find meaning 
meaning even in the chaos of these times. In fact, I have to tell you, when I really try to pray and think about this, okay, God, in the midst of the craziness of what is going on, what are you up to? It seems to me that a particle of what that might mean, <laughs> and only a particle, is that I, as well as many other Christians who are used to trusting in institutions to somehow guide us into the future, to which that hope is being shattered daily, I'm now having to learn and lean upon the God who is Lord of heaven and earth in a whole new way. That the meaning of my life is actually not where I did or did not go to school, or what I actually might have in terms of inheritance or family or bank account. That meaning at this point, because all of that becomes quite meaningless in the face of collapsing tragedy, that the only thing in fact that provides a level of meaning that actually gives purpose, meaning, a richness to human relationships, the capacity to be able to give and serve, is the fact that the eternal Son of God, who is in the midst of setting things right that I can't see but is surely true, is at work, and that is the eternal purpose that I want to be about even as things fall apart. Because you see, regardless of where I live and go and work and serve, I have an obligation if I call myself by the name of Jesus to live with eternity in view to live with the power of God in the present. Otherwise, all I'm doing is serving the temporal and the chaotic in a way that will only eat me up and drag me down with it. Is that what I want in my life? Is that what you want in yours? Could it be that we are somehow being weaned away from any other place of trust, be it political or economic or social, so that all that we have to call upon is the name of this great God and Savior, as He is called in the Scripture, and to find a level of trust, meaning, and purpose in Him, even as we see other things collapse. Who will stand up otherwise as things continue to fall, except those who know that they walk with eternity wrapped around them as with a garment? and not in a place of arrogance, we've seen plenty of that, but rather the kind of empowerment that gives us the capacity to serve and to give, no matter how little we might have, because we know that we're giving in to men and women who God profoundly values, even if they are of little value to the world, and that actually puts eternity in view where as we stand before Him in the judgment seat of Christ, we and all others will shine like the sun. Beloved, please do not allow the beauty of this hour to merely be an act of escape, temporary distraction from all that will face you when you go home and turn the television back on again. Instead, may it be for you, for me, a place to remind us of the eternal, of the powerful, of that which has come to set us free, of he who comes as a baby to rescue. And that no matter who we are, where we've been, or whatever we have done, we can find a place in a manger. It was Dorothy Day who said these words, I'm so glad that Jesus was born in a stable because my soul is so much like a stable. It is poor, in unsatisfactory condition because of guilt and falsehoods, inadequacies, brokenness, sin. Yet I believe that if Jesus can be born in a stable, perhaps he can be born in me. Beloved, we are invited in. We are invited in to poise, purpose, humility, repentance. And as the Wessex carol that was sung earlier by the choir says, birth. 
Mirth is the laughter of relief. Mirth is the joy of seeing things turned out right in a way that you never might have expected. Mirth is when the door opens and the beloved walks in and you go, <laughs> finally! That's glory to God in the highest. So come. Don't settle for the oppression of darkness and the gloomy sadness that lures, lures over so many. Ask God to take that heart of yours and of mine and bring it into the place of joy in the midst of the dusty and dirty stable of Bethlehem, that what we walk out with is bigger than an hour. Heaven and earth in little space, one carol describes Jesus, in us, that we might live with that same purpose and power. Amen.